Today's webinar helps Allergy and Asthma Network live out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. It is presented in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Advances in Allergy and Asthma. We are joined today by Dr. Rushi Gupta as we look at disparities in food allergy. Uh, Rushi Gupta is a professor of pediatrics and medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and a clinical attending at Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. She has more than 16 years of experience as a board certified pediatrician and health researcher and currently serves as the founding director of the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research or CIFAR at these institutions. Dr. Gupta is nationally recognized for her groundbreaking research in the areas of food allergy and asthma, most notably for her research on the prevalence of pediatric and adult food allergy in the United States. She is the author of The Food Allergy Experience, has written and co-authored over 150 peer-reviewed research manuscripts, and has had her work featured on major TV networks and in print media. She and her team strive to improve the lives of children and their families through their research and hope to continue finding answers and shaping policies around allergic conditions. Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing not only your enthusiasm and energy, but your expertise as well. Thank you so much, Sally. Uh, so happy to be here today to talk about this very important topic. Um, here are my disclosures. And then here we go with the objectives of today. So uh, disparities in food allergy is a very important topic that's uh, recently gotten more attention, which I'm so grateful for, because it's an area that we have been focused on for years in the center. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we know about it, and then really want to have a discussion about where do we go next and what can we do. So our objectives are to identify racial and ethnic differences in food allergy prevalence and outcomes among U.S. children, to de describe socioeconomic burden of food allergy among children from different income strata, and to explore challenges to food allergy care experienced by children, specifically children enrolled in Medicaid. All right, let's get started talking about prevalence and outcomes. So what do we know about uh, racial and ethnic differences in food allergy? Well, in the beginning, this is, this is a study, I, one of the first ones that started to uh, really characterize any differences that we see in types of food allergy by race. And this was uh, a study done by Scott Schischer, uh, where he did a random digit dialing telephone survey and looked at uh, differences um, in many ways, but here's the one around race. And this, he found back then in 2002 that it seemed that um, black children had a higher rate of both finfish and shellfish allergy when compared to white children. Here's another one. This is a little bit more recent, but this is from the national database, the NHANES database. And again, here you can see that they found that there were higher food allergy rates among black children and adults relative to their white and Hispanic peers. So here you can see this um, in children, it was slightly higher and even in adults, they found it to be slightly higher. Now in this NHANES um, national survey, it was based on one question, which is do you or your child have any food allergies? So this is reported by either, you know, the parent for themselves or for their child. Now, uh, another amazing cohort is the Detroit area wheels birth cohort. And this data suggests that there are racial differences in allergic sensitization, but not in food allergy prevalence. And this was in, uh, in children age three. So what this means is they did find a significant difference in specific IgEs. So sensitization, so do you have a specific IgE to milk, egg, or peanut? And then they found this is greater than 0.35 as a positive specific IgE, although it does not mean you have that allergy. It means you are sensitized. So the sensitization, um, so that, that positive test among black uh, children was higher. However, 
when they looked to see if they actually had the food allergy, it was not significantly different. So um, this was what we would call a little bit of a false positive for that. Now this is a study we did in Illinois just to look at differences in anaphylaxis among Illinois children. And this is the trend we saw. So if you, the blue line are black children and white line um, or red line is uh, white children. And you can see from 2008, um, they kind of met up around 2010 with equal numbers of um, food-induced anaphylaxis uh, ED visits or hospitalizations. And then you can see this increase uh, in black children uh, coming to the emergency department or being hospitalized for food-induced anaphylaxis. Here we see racial differences in food allergy phenotype and healthcare utilization among U.S. children, and this is um, a great study that we collaborated with Rush uh, and with Cincinnati Children's on to look at uh, databases. So this was like a retrospective cohort where they looked into their databases of children coming in uh, with food allergy and looked at it by race. So here you have um, white, black, and Hispanic. And again, you can see significantly more uh, food-induced anaphylaxis, significantly more ED visits uh, in black children, more asthma, uh, and then allergic rhinitis slightly higher, but then an eczema slightly higher. So we're starting to see this trend, which is really interesting because I have to tell you, when I got in this field 16 years ago, there wasn't much known, but we didn't know, you know, or consider that there were racial disparities uh, specific to food allergy. But if you think about the atopic spectrum, so eczema, then going to allergies, environmental allergies or food, and then leading to asthma, you know, we knew that there were differences and disparities in eczema. We knew there were differences, disparities in asthma. So we had a hunch that there must be for food allergy as well. So it's, um, it's interesting to see this body of literature start to grow. And it's very, very important for us because if we know what those differences are, then we can help better treat and manage um, by an individual and their characteristics and not necessarily by a full population. So these types of um, better understanding is, is really critical for us to be able to better manage um, children and adults with food allergies. So this is a study, uh, we, you know, we've been working on prevalence studies in our center for a long time and, and this is our most recent data from 2015-2016 where we looked at almost 40,000 children and almost 40,000 adults across the United States, it's a very representative sample. We asked a series of questions and then based on their responses to the questions we have reported or if they had convincing symptoms based on this criteria here, you don't have to read this, but this is an extensive criteria we made with an expert group to really uh, determine what were convincing symptoms. And then we also asked them about physician diagnosis. So what did we find in terms of uh, potential disparities? Well, what we found were that black children had higher rates of food allergy than any other um, background. So here you see the convincing food allergy um, overall, about 7.6%, um, and then about 4.2% overall had a physician diagnosis, and that's in the entire sample. And then here you can see the differences um, by racial group. So, um, you know, for black children, it was, they were reporting 8.9%. And this, this number, 5.9%, were actually getting uh, a diagnosed with it. Um, and then you can see in Asians, it was 6.5. And then 3.9% were getting a diagnosis. Hispanic children, 8.4%, which is also significantly higher, um, with 4.9% having a, a physician diagnosis, and then multiple on the other races. Now this is by food. So it's it's interesting to see what differences um, there may be in food allergies and are there differences in, in the type of food allergies um, different racial or ethnic groups have. And here, um, these are the significant values. So you can see peanut um, slightly significant, uh, but the ones that are, are sig really significant here you can see is shellfish, which was significantly higher 
um, in black children and finfish. So something about those seafood allergies here um, are in play, and this is really important for us to know so we can better understand uh, why that's happening. Now here again, is I showed this before in other studies, and I just want to point it out, we found the same findings that um, lifetime and previous 12-month emergency department visits were also higher in both Black and Hispanic children. So what are we going to do about this, you know, and how are we going to better understand it? So I'm very excited uh, about a study that we have, and we're in year three of it. It's called the FORWARD study, Food Allergy Outcomes Related to White and African American Racial Differences. And this is a study that we are partnering with uh, four institutions, Cincinnati Children's, uh, Dr. Assad, DC Children's, Dr. Sharma, Rush, Dr. Mary Tobin, and um, of course here at Lurie Children's Hospital. Now, this is one of the first NIH, I feel like R01 studies examining racial differences in food allergy burden. And our goal is to enroll a thousand families at between these four sites through 2020. Um, we're getting closer. We have 350 uh, black children enrolled and 450 white children currently. Recently, uh, we also received an NIAID supplement to expand our recruitment to Latinx families. So this is wonderful. So now we're not only going to be able to look at differences in multiple areas. So this is not only just their phenotype, you know, what allergies do they have? We're looking at how they're diagnosed. We're looking at their lab values. We're collecting um, microbiome samples to look at differences in gut or skin microbiome. Um, we're looking at their management, their quality of life, their uh, shopping habits. We really want to be able to personalize medicine, to understand challenges faced by different groups and how we can best um, serve them. Oh, well, this is a little bit of what I talked about. So basically we meet them at clinic. Um, we extract all their data from their electronic medical records. Uh, and then we, you know, if they will give us blood and serum, um, then we collect that as well as microbiome. And this will help us really better understand it, uh, biomarkers and how the microbiome plays in. And then we follow them up uh, at 12 months and then again at 24 months. And the arrow is because we want to continue to follow them and have this cohort that we can follow long-term to see as these children turn into teenagers and into adults, you know, what else changes in their lives. Um, we're asking a ton of surveys and these families are so wonderful to participate in that. Um, we are asking about everything, as you can see, from you know when they outgrow a food allergy, how they purchase their foods, their quality of life, their knowledge around it, um, other things around asthma and eczema and schools. So lots and lots of good information. So uh, hopefully we will have um, many, many more answers than we do right now. Okay, I'm gonna move on. We're gonna go into economic impact of food allergies. I definitely wanna leave time for a conversation because this is a very important area and I would love your thoughts as well. Um, so economic impact. So this is a study we published um, back in 2013. So these numbers are probably quite a bit higher today and we are planning on redoing this study, but basically we found that food allergies in the US cost about $24.8 billion a year. And that's about $4,000 per year per child. Now, we broke these costs into a number of different areas. So medical costs, out-of-pocket costs, lost labor productivity, and food allergy-related opportunity costs. I'm gonna go through these very quickly. I just wanna show you overall. So this is direct medical costs. And as you can see here, uh, the direct medical costs are any, any provider that they go to or emergency department or a hospitalization. And that number was about $4.3 billion per year, about $724 per child with food allergy. Out-of-pocket costs. So we asked families what they spend money on for their child's food allergies. And they told us many, many things. And you can see it. These are medications, antihistamines, epinephrine, travel, um, other prescription meds. But the top thing that they spent money on, as you can see here, that circled that 1,000, 1. actually $1.7 um, million 
is uh, cost, or sorry, billion dollars, is cost associated with special diets and allergen-free foods. So the cost of food and keeping them safe and those diets was the biggest thing that people were spending out-of-pocket cost uh, money on. Okay, now here we see opportunity costs. So this is any uh, caregiver had to give up their job, lost their job, changed their job. Uh, so basically something changed in their career that um, cost them. And so this was really big. And we hear about this all the time. Parents of young children, you know, not being able to travel or wanting to be close in case their child had an allergic reaction in school, et cetera. So this is something pretty much every talk I go to give, you know, everybody seems to be able to relate to but it was a total of $14.2 billion a year. So here is the final assessment of cost. So you can see, we also asked about willingness to pay. So how much would you be willing to pay to get rid of your child's food allergy? And that was about 20.8 billion. So about 3,500 uh, per child per year. And if you look here, I just wanna show you the reported cost borne by families was 20.5 billion. So it was almost identical to this willingness to pay number, which was um, a source of validity for us for these numbers were accurate because people were willing in their minds kind of figured out how much they were spending. And that is, you know, pretty much the exact same number that they were willing to pay to get rid of it. And then if you look here, this is direct medical costs, which is usually covered by insurance for a grand total of 24.8 billion a year. Okay. So then we were able to look at this data and analyze it and say, huh, do any differences actually exist by race, ethnicity, or income with the spending? And this is what we found. So here you see uh, income. And you know, a lot of times I say the research we do is a bit common sense research, um, but you have to show it to make something happen and change policies and, and actually do something about it. So here, Obviously, people who make less than um, 50,000 families who make less than 50,000 are not going to be able to spend as much on things like special foods or medication costs. But you can see, let's go down here first, the special food costs significantly less, half is of what um, higher income families are spending. And same with medication, pretty much half of what higher income families are spending. But then when you go to ED visits, that's double right? Because they're not able to spend on medications and special diets. So of course, they're having to spend more on emergency department visits and hospitalizations for that food allergic reaction. And again, here you can see the amount they're spending on specialists is less. So oftentimes, these kids also don't have um, access to a specialist. Now here it is by race. Um, which was also very interesting. So if you again go to special foods, if you look at white children, they were spending about 1,200 a year on special diets compared to African-American children, which was 177, Hispanic children and Asian children, which was the least at 148. So this is not necessarily based on income. So why do we see these large differences? Um, is it something around awareness or education or, or what we're doing as providers. And then here you can see medications, you see similar, much lower in Asian and African-American families um, compared to white families. And then you go to specialist cost again, and all three of these groups are spending less on specialist visits. So again, meaning they are they not getting to the allergist to be able to help um, manage their food allergy? and and educate on, on what needs to be done. And then ED hospital costs, you can see, at least in this Asian population, it is more than double. So children in the lowest household income stratum incurred two and a half times emergency department and hospitalization costs as a result of their food allergy. Spending on special specialist visits was lower in low income children, out of pocket, medication costs were lower, and African-American children incurred at least the least direct medical costs and spent the least on out-of-pocket costs compared with other racial and ethnic groups. Okay, so now we'll get into Medicaid population. 
after we did a lot of this research, we were wondering, you know, that whole idea of are they not getting to a specialist? Um, are they not getting properly diagnosed when they have a food allergy? Because when we looked at the general population, our prevalence numbers are, you know, 8%. 8% of kids have food allergy. That's about one in 13, about two in every classroom. But is that the whole population or are we missing kids? And so when we looked at the Medicaid database, we were shocked because the prevalence of food allergy among Medicaid enrolled children across the United States was substantially lower. It was 0.6% compared to that national estimate I just gave you around 8%. And even amongst that 8% national average, about 4.7% had a physician diagnosis. So let's even compare it to that number. 0.6% had a uh, diagnosis of food allergy in the Medicaid database compared to 4.7% of the national population of all children. So what's going on? Where, why are they not getting diagnosed? And, and this is what brings up these really, really important questions. You know, how do we make sure these children get diagnosed and then they get properly managed? And you know, one thing I'll tell you just personally from my own clinic and anecdotes are um, food allergy is really different than asthma because sometimes um, these kids will have food allergies and um, they'll avoid the food. But when they come in for their clinic visit, we really need to focus on their asthma and how that's doing in exacerbations and make sure they have medications. And oftentimes in those quick visits, uh, we don't even get to discussing the food allergy because uh, the parents feel like there's no medication for it. There's nothing we can do. And so they, they do their best to avoid the food, but don't go on to get all the management they necessarily need. And so as providers, we have to be very conscious of that. And if we do see any children, you know, what I've started doing is just asking, you know, are, are you avoiding any foods, you know, or are you um, feeling like anything happens when you eat any specific food? And, and that sometimes brings up the conversation, almost like how we ask about drug allergies to every patient. Um, it's a quick question that we can include to make sure that we focus on making the diagnosis for, for children who may not necessarily come up. So this is from that Medicaid database. Again, you can see the differences. So we are diagnosing things like asthma, right? So you can see higher rates of asthma. The, this line, the black line is, um, is white children. So that's where they were. And then Hispanic children, um, American Indian children, and black children had significantly higher odds of having asthma and you can see atopic derm as well, um, less likely to have allergic rhinitis and more likely to have food allergy. Oh, sorry, less likely, sorry. Hispanic children were less likely, American Indian children were less likely, but you do have um, slightly higher rates in black children, but not, it's not significant. Um, but then you can see here, this is Pacific Island and Asian children. So outcomes and factors associated with pre-hospital treatment of pediatric anaphylaxis. And I just wanna point out, this was a, a paper we recently published with some of our emergency department doctors. And we found that children with Medicaid received pre-ED epi less frequently than children with private insurance. So significantly, look at this, 24, so one in four were getting epinephrine in the Medicaid population versus almost half with private insurance. Um, and this is prior to coming into the emergency department. Medicaid insurance was associated with decreased likelihood of pre-hospital epi, and the odds ratio was significant. So next thing, so we get all this data, you know, we're starting a large NIH study to enroll a longitudinal cohort that we can continue to learn from. But what can we do? What can we actually do right now to, um, to help families? So this is a study, uh, it's called the Food Allergy Management and in Low-Income Youth Study, so the family study. And our goal was to really understand what the barriers were, what the issues were, and then try to develop something to um, support all families. So this was a qualitative exploration of food allergy management within a Medicaid insured population 
and all of the participants in this population did have a physician diagnosis. We did qualitative interviews uh, with, with 10 families and um, Justin, who was one of our, our research coordinators, who still is, um, helped conduct these with many others on our team. As you can see here, it's an all-star team, Alexandria. Um, we have a clinical psychologist on our team. And we also did this in conjunction with Stanford. So um, Stanford helped support the study. What did we find? Here we go. So for three big areas, limited primary caregiver knowledge around the food allergy, poor inter-caregiver management, and insecure access to allergen-free foods. So three very, very important areas. And um, let's start with limited primary caregiver knowledge. So there was confusion about symptoms, treatment, and aftercare of a reaction. And this is so understandable because the problem with food allergy that's different from asthma and all other conditions is that it can impact any organ system. So it is very confusing to know if the child is having a food allergic reaction or something else, right? So you can have GI, you can have vomiting, you can have respiratory difficulty breathing, you can have skin, you know, rash and hives and swelling. You can have cardiovascular, a drop in blood pressure, um, and then you can have the neuro, the dizziness that goes along with that as well. Um, and then the other big thing was uncertainty surrounding their child-specific allergens. So they weren't completely clear, and we've seen this even in a recent survey we did. You know, people are unsure if they truly still have the allergy or, or which ones, because a lot of times you find out by testing and not necessarily by food challenges. So is the testing accurate? And you know, as we know, there are many, many false positives. And then a faulty prescription perception of risk. So not really understanding what the risk is of a food allergy, the fact that it can be severe and life-threatening, um, what those reactions may be. Now here you see, I'm gonna go here next, poor inter-caregiver management. So treat a reaction should it occur. Like, how do you treat that reaction? Understanding the severity of child's food allergy, which nobody really completely understands because you can have a different reaction um, at different time points. And we don't have a severity spectrum for food allergy, yet everywhere you take a child, they ask you, oh, well, how severe is the child's food allergy? And so it's difficult when others are asking the family, but as um, clinicians, we don't really know how to answer that. And then how to properly manage food allergy. So what exactly do you do is very confusing to families. And then finally, insecure access. Whoops, I'm not sure why Siri went off, sorry. <laughs> anyway, insecure access to allergen-free foods. And this is really important because, you know, we're doing a whole study with the Quad AI right now to really understand how much we assess this with our patients because we tell them they can't eat, you know, so many foods sometimes, you know, five, six foods and such common foods like milk and egg and soy and wheat, you know, and then not only the peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish, finfish, or sesame. So, you know, how, whoops, sorry, how are families accessing those foods? So they told us allergen-free meals are difficult to access and they're time consuming to pre prepare and they're often expensive because to get a uh, food that has no precautionary allergen labeling and no ingredients, you often have to go to specialty sites, websites, or specialty stores. These are, I just wanted to, you know, read you some of the quotes from families because, you know, hearing it from them is really drives this home. So caregiver knowledge. Participants described a lack of knowledge or uncertainty surrounding food allergy. I do think that the doctors don't really tell you when to use the epinephrine auto injector. Now that I'm thinking about it, they don't tell you use it only if it's severe or use it at all times. Like actually they don't say that. Or maybe I haven't just had the conversation. So, you know, this participant was trying to even remember if that conversation occurred and what they said. So this is really important because as we know, when we do see patients, they typically can't take in everything we're telling them about, you know, all the different, you know, 
questions they may have. So how do we make sure they go home knowing what to do in case of an emergency? Now, next, inter-caregiver management. Participants describe concern over the competency of other caregivers. So it gets hard because I don't know if they're going to feed him that, if they're going to be careful like we are. So again, when you have multiple caregivers, um, this often comes up to see if everybody is on the same page. And then safe foods. Participants describe concern as to whether the child could avoid their allergen. So I would say the biggest challenge is finding food that fits, um, you know, all of his restrictions. So again, how do you find foods that are safe? Because most children have multiple food allergies, not just one food. And then psychosocial. Participants describe the impact on the mental health and of their child and the caregiver. So I guess sometimes, um, yeah, it does. Many Hispanics have the idea that you um, put that allergy upon your child. You did it yourself. You know it's not. They don't think it's a genetic thing. They don't. They sometimes, if they're older, they're very close-minded and they kind of blame it on me and my husband. Now this is really, really difficult to think about and um, understand, but I think we all have guilt, you know, like did we do something? And, and I get asked this all the time, is it because I ate it when I was pregnant? Is it because I ate it when I was breastfeeding? Um, but the fact that many families, because this food allergy experience has grown so quickly over a generation, you know, I've heard many times that um, older generations don't understand it or don't believe it or, or you know, what, what did you do potentially? Um, to cause this in your child. And I'll tell you a funny story is um, I, I was um, made to feel guilty nationally when the New York Times asked me about the new early introduction guidelines for peanut, right? So now the guidelines are we need to start peanut early for infants because it could prevent peanut allergy. So this is a really, really important discovery because now we have a way to potentially prevent peanut allergy. And my own daughter has a peanut allergy. And so when I was interviewed for the New York Times, they asked me if I had fed it to my daughter in that first year of life. And I said, no, because the guidelines at that time said, don't feed your child peanuts till age three. So um, interestingly, uh, in the New York Times, it says, you know, Dr. Gupta is slapping herself on the wrist, wrist, wrist for not feeding her um, own child peanuts early. So there is guilt for all of us and plenty to go around. But I think what's so important is we as providers have to make sure families know that it is nothing they did. And there's no data suggesting if you eat it during pregnancy or, or, or while breastfeeding or all of these things that you are causing the food allergy to your child. Okay, so I do wanna leave at least 15 minutes to be able to um, hear your thoughts and for you to ask questions. But I do wanna tell you, um, as we continued this family study, we did take everything uh, those families told us and we created something that we call a passport, a food allergy um, passport. And it is, uh, something that kids can have. We're trying to develop it into an app form and then it's in a paper form. And so it's it's a little booklet that they fill out and you can see this first page where they ask, you know, general questions about them and they carry this with them and what their food allergies are. And then it goes on, you know, it has, has multiple pages and anyone is interested, you are more than welcome. You know, we are happy to provide this. We want this to be available for anyone who wants it. Um, but you can see we tried to simplify, and although this isn't an official emergency action plan, when we ran this by families, they felt like it was easier to understand, at least for themselves. Um, it gives them a little bit better idea of, you know, when to use epinephrine, um, what they should make sure they do that they can give their friends and families, and has the visuals of how to, um, how to use the different auto-injectors. There's much more, there's a whole workbook in here. Um, and then, you know, there's this sticker page. There's, there's a ton in here. And we would love for any of you uh, to use it, to use it with your own families, to use it, spread it to your friends. Um, we want 
to be able to help spread all these resources that we're all developing and collecting. Some other stuff that we're doing, which I'm very, very excited about is with the Food Equality Initiative. Um, it is a amazing organization led by an incredible woman. Um, and that this organization has really been focused for years on uh, providing food allergic individuals or people with food conditions um, safe foods and food insecurity safe foods. So there is a real big need in this country right now, especially with COVID-19, where um, more people are becoming food insecure. And if they have um, food conditions like food allergy, it's n even harder to get those safe foods. So Emily Brown herself, the woman who started this organization, is a woman who had food allergic kids and was food insecure and had to go to food banks and noticed how difficult it was for her to be able to get safe foods and then took it upon herself to do something about it and started this organization. And we are partnering with them. Um, we wrote uh, this paper together, Current Policy Changes Needed for Food Allergic Households with Food Insecurity During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And you can see, you know, this is our goal. This is what we want um, to reduce restrictions on WIC um, the allowable foods to ensure safe brands right now, this is not happening. Provide access to appropriate and safe meals through public school system. Accommodations, accommodate needs of food allergic households and food banks and food pantries. And adjust the emergency food assistance program policies to ensure there are uh, commodities uh, free of the common allergens. Sorry. <laughs> um, so what we know is that 32 million Americans have food allergies and 11% of US households are food insecure. So there are many people living with food allergic conditions or food conditions in general and food insecurity that we have to work together to support. Future policy changes that are needed for food allergic households with food insecurity. We need to use health insurance to pay for prescriptions for allergen-free foods. So I, as a, a pediatrician, could write a prescription um, for you know, peanut-free foods and families would be able to go um, take that and insurance would pay for it and make sure that they're able to access safe food. So how do we make this happen? Well, that's something we all need to work on together and um, Food Equality Initiative has quite a few ideas. Um, so basically, a couple of things, again, the collaboration with um, the Center for Community Health at Northwestern to introduce some COVID uh, recovery grants for organizations. Um, we did this um, through our center. We co-authored a COVID-19 editorial, and this was this one, Food Insecure and Allergic in a Pandemic of Vulnerable Population. We're collaborating again to try to um, publish some of the Food Equality Initiative's data to show that it is working and this need exists because you need those papers out there to start changing these kinds of policies. And we're working to expand FBI's delivery model nationally to serve patients with food allergies and celiac disease by doing a delivery model of um, ordering online and having safe foods delivered to your door. Now we're also partnering with the Quad AI. Um, we're partnering with uh, Jody Shroba. She's at Children's Mercy. And the two of us are leading this initiative in the Quad AI to understand what is happening in allergy clinics around screening for food insecurity and whether um, you know it is happening at all, what kind of resources allergists may need um, to support their families so that we can start developing those things. Our goal is to make food insecurity screenings a routine part of allergy visits, and the survey is currently being administered to the Quad AI members, and hopefully we will have the results by the end of the year. So in conclusion, racial ethnic differences in food allergy outcomes do exist. Um, as we saw, black children do have higher rates of food allergy prevalence compared to white children. Children in the lowest household income stratum incurred two and a half times emergency department uh, costs as a result of their food allergy, um, and they also spent, you know, less on special diets and on medications. And barriers to epinephrine treatment are 
evident among children with public insurance. Um, there's so many more conclusions. I know we talked about so much, but I do want to end on this quote that is by Maya Angelou, um, one of my absolute favorites. It's do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And I think that's where we all are now. We know better and now we have to make sure we do better to support all children and families with food allergy. And then I'm gonna, hold on, sorry. Um, if you do want any of these materials or get in touch with us, please do, we would love it. Um, our website is here, a lot of our materials are on our website. Um, everything is free, um, so please download it. If you want us to send you materials, we'd love to if you can utilize any of this. Um, just like uh, AAN, you know, they do so much for um, underserved communities and it's very, very important part of our mission as well. So um, also we do have social media and then of course we are the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research. Okay, and now I'm turn it back to you, Sally, ready for questions? Well, it's more a question of are you ready for questions? But Dr. Gupta, thank you so much. That was really a great presentation. It certainly got me thinking a lot about who's who and what's what. So if we can just go back to the question slide, we'll leave it there for right now. And our first question, our, our, uh, our participant says, sorry, I joined a little bit late, but what is the major factor or factors making the difference between the different ethnic groups? when it comes to food allergy prevalence? Wow, that is a excellent question. Um, and I wish I could tell you I knew, um, but <laughs> I don't. Uh, and that is part of our forward study. So we really want to understand that. So we are, you know, by looking at biomarkers, by looking at microbiome, by looking at, um, you know, all the environmental factors that go into it, um, hopefully we'll have a better understanding. What we do know, and we see this in asthma too, is in asthma and food allergies and eczema and, you know, allergic rhinitis are all tied together. So if you have one, you have a higher chance of having the others. So, you know, obviously there's partially genetic, but um, there's other environmental factors that may, may be at play. And so we need to now really dig into that and see if there's things that we can do to prevent, you know, in, in um, certain high risk populations, like how do we prevent some of these food allergies from happening? And, you know, we're starting to learn more and more about that. We have a study we're doing here that we are gonna do in a, a racially, ethnically and socioeconomically diverse population to look at infants and follow them and follow um, what happens and what can happen if we do introduce certain foods early to their diet, are there other factors that are more powerful in play, both in the environment or genetically? So um, a lot of the research is fo focusing on that and mainly in ways to better understand, is there something we can do early in life to prevent it? So maybe next time I may have some more answers for you, but great, great question. Well, I think it's awfully important that the questions are being asked in the research world because that's how we're going to get the answers. Okay, our next question is, why are allergen-free meals ready to eat encouraged when it's far less expensive to just eat whole foods and thus far easier to avoid allergens? Well, you know, I'm not completely clear on that question, but you know, the top nine allergens are, you know, of course we talk about nuts, which may be a little bit easier to avoid, peanuts and tree nuts, and potentially shellfish and finfish. But when you think about the other allergens, top ones, it's egg, milk, wheat, soy, and sesame. And all of those are very challenging to avoid, even in, I guess, what's called whole foods. So, um, so many people have, a combination of multiple food allergies. So how do you, uh, you know, prepare the right meals or get foods that are free from all of those, um, which is very challenging, especially when you go into precautionary allergen labeling. And, and if it's kids, you know, they're often eating with their friends and they are often eating, you know, bag of chips or cookies or um, things like that. And people can be allergic to really any food, those top nine, you know, are the majority, but 
any food. So it isn't easy for them, families, to always avoid all of those foods without being able to know where to go. And, you know, that also brings up, you know, other things we don't do for these families who do have multiple allergies is how do they get access to someone who can help them know what are healthy, nutritious diets when you're taking so many of these important nutrients out of their daily meals? Um, so a nutritionist, um, a dietitian, you know, how do we how do we make sure that they are getting the nutrition they need when avoiding some really key food elements? Oh, thank you so much. Our next question is, when should children start eating peanuts? Ah, oh, okay. Now we'll go to prevention. So very good question. So the current um, guidelines say that infants should, so if you're you know, a, a clinician or if you're a parent, basically you need to see uh, if that infant has some of the main risk factors. And one of the main risk factors for developing food allergy is eczema. So we talked about atopy and, you know, atopic march. It always starts with eczema. So eczema starts usually very early in infants. And if your infant has eczema, they should talk to their pediatrician because if that eczema is severe, they need to be evaluated. And that's through testing or getting to an allergist. If your child does not have severe eczema, if they just have mild eczema um, or no eczema, then you really can start introducing peanut products around that six month mark. So when they're starting to eat solids, like depending on when your infant is ready, ready for solids, um, introduce a couple other foods first, you know, the, the fruits and veggies, and then um, on to peanut. And if you do start peanut, don't ever introduce the true peanut. We want to do peanut butter, um, but water it down. So uh, about two teaspoons of peanut butter mixed with similar about two, two and a half teaspoons of water until it gets to a consistency uh, that your infant can tolerate. And then introduce it slowly to them the first time and observe them, be there to observe them throughout that time. And if they hopefully will like it because it's pretty tasty, then you continue that and you do it at least um, two to three times a week and keep it in their diet. And it's nutritious, peanut butter is. Um, there's other products out there. There's um, like a peanut butter cracker uh, called Bamba, or there's a lot of other brands that make it. Um, and there's there's multiple products that you can use to get that peanut into your infant. But one important thing is don't just introduce it once and stop. You need to continue to keep it in their diet. So, uh, which is, like I said, good because it's nutritious as well. So. I hope I hope that answered your question. Now, if you're high risk, it is also very important that you get tested quickly because you want to get peanuts into high risk infants as early as possible. Um, so for high risk infants, it's important to get evaluated around four months and to get it into their diets um, after, you know, the allergist says, yes, go, or the pediatrician says, yes, you can start. Wonderful. That's so helpful. Uh, can you speak about the FDA's temporary labeling of foods with allergens present? Has it caused any problems to your knowledge? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I've heard um, a lot about it, and I know um, a lot of organizations responded to that temporary labeling ban, um, but I haven't heard personally of any any issues it's caused. I don't know, Sally, if you know as a more of an advocate through an advocacy organization. Well, there, it, it's, it was uh, something that was supposed to be temporary, and we're just going to just have to see how things uh, play out, but I know that it's been an issue for some people. So, okay, our next question is, um, uh, do you have any good encouraging verbiage to convince more lay people who work in schools learn how to be prepared for anaphylaxis. I've offered training on EpiPens and a lot of staff seem very discouraged or intimidated despite Epi being a very safe drug to handle and there's legal protection through the Good Samaritan law. What can I do? Uh, yes, this is something I hear about all the time. And yes, we do have resources for you um, as do you know many organizations, but I'll tell you about what we have. So I. I would hear this a lot. And the big issue with epinephrine auto injectors are that they are a shot and people get scared of them. And how do we get people to understand, you know, the basics that it 
only hold it in for you know three seconds and and it can go through clothing and you don't ever see the needle because a lot of people have that needle fear um and it's adrenaline it's what's in you naturally so you're not you know giving some you know massive you know amount of something dangerous so those are important things to convey but what we did to support um, families and schools is we made a, a group of school videos and they're uh, for elementary, middle, and high school, we have a new set that's for daycare because um, an early childhood uh, teacher came to me and said, this is great, but you don't have anything for when this all really starts in, in child care centers. So we just made a whole training video for child care centers and we're working on the college age. And all of those are available for free on our website. And they also have frequently asked questions, guides for schools and teachers. Um, so please, and the high school one shows the administration of epinephrine by a, a fellow student. This was all based on what research and what kids told us they wanted, you know, other kids and their schools and teachers to know. So um, we do have those resources and we have, um, we're actually trying, we're working on it right now. I'm happy to send it to you. We have like PowerPoints for schools that we can give you if you do want to go give them a talk that kind of are pre-made and and ready to go and have the data in it to help you out. But that is, that's a, a really important um, issue that so many people face is how do you convince the school that this is really important and they need to be prepared and take away that fear of using epinephrine. And, you know, the other way we do it a lot of times in conferences are we, we take um, expired epinephrine auto injectors. So, you know, if you keep your expired epinephrine auto injectors because they expire every year, then you can show them, like have them hold a real one. The trainers are great too. I, I've done that with schools many times, but if they can hold a real one and get a grapefruit or an orange or something and put it into that, it really just makes them feel more comfortable because once they've done it and they see, oh, okay, I don't, you know, it wasn't as hard as I thought. Okay, the yeah, I don't really see the needle and it went in pretty easily. I think uh, I think they start feeling a lot more confident. We even do this with kids and have them use it on grapefruits and it makes them um, less fearful of getting it and less fearful of administering it. Thank you, as a school nurse, I know when people realized they weren't going to see the needle, that made all the difference in the world. Um, someone saying to you, thank you for bringing this to our awareness. I've encountered difficulty with obtaining appropriate food items for students who are in the school free and reduced lunch program who have multiple allergies. Any suggestions on how to bridge this gap? Yes, no, that is, I've, I've seen this so many times. It is very challenging. And um, I would, I would, you know, reach out to Sally and <laughs> reach out to <laughs> me and we will help put you in touch. And, the Food Equality Initiative is a great place to go. They they connect with uh, a lot of organizations or a lot of food products also out there that um, that really do specialize in allergen-free foods um, are willing to partner with schools and give you know free foods um, or discounted so that it can fit into a school program. So I know that through this. They've partnered with a number of companies that really want to be able to get um, that access issue, you know, fixed. And so they are willing to to donate products or somehow find a way to get these kids um, safe food. So please, I mean, reach out and we'll we'll put you in touch with the right people. Thank you so much. We are at, at the time that we need to finish up. I'll just tell you one person wrote, bravo, great information. Thank you so much. So, uh, so that was, that was uh, someone expressing their appreciation for everything you had to say today. And Dr. Gupta, we are just so grateful you could be with us. But oh I, I'd also like to thank our listeners today. Thank you for joining us. At this time, please download that certificate of attendance from your control panel if you're listening live. If you have difficulties, please email us using the link in your emails. Please join us next month for our webinar when Dr. Mark Corbett will present on inhaler confusion, the right medication, right technique at the right time. This webinar will air on Thursday, October 22nd at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Look for news in the horizontal navigational bar near the top of the page 
and look for webinars. You can also view our archived webinars on this page on our website. Visit our website for quality, guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also access important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to having you register to be with us next time on Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This is Sally Schessler for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. We work every day to help all of us breathe better together. <laughs>